Uh, welcome everyone to the director's uh, special colloquium on learning from nature. Uh, thank you all for being here this morning. Really fabulous. Uh, we've been very fortunate uh, uh, to have our speaker, the Marine Biological Laboratory Director Nipam Patel, and several of his coll colleagues here at the laboratory yesterday and today. We are continuing a conversation we actually started uh, last May in terms of enhancing the collaboration between Argonne and, and MBL, and so really. Uh, just a fantastic conversation, very fruitful. Uh, I think we're quite excited about doing things uh, together uh, more intentionally and more strategically and, and also in the near term, which has got me pretty excited. Uh, in this very room, uh, I got challenged early as uh, during one of my conversations with Kearns, uh, early in my time as a laboratory director, uh, for Argonne to do more uh, in biology. And uh, I think uh, that's still an aspiration. That's still something we're working on. And this conversation really is a part of moving in that direction. And so expect to hear more as we move forward. So really fantastic in that way. I appreciate uh, being challenged uh, in that way to really do something more impactful in terms of our bio biology research. So thank you. Uh, as you know, the laboratory is dedicated to leadership in science and technology that benefits society. And our guest speaker today really is emblematic of that idea. Uh, this morning, Nipam will share with us his focus on finding solutions to human humanity's most complex problems in what would, what would uh, many would consider the most unexpected corners of our world. In fact, many of the answers uh, to our ongoing questions might be found in nature. We just need a better understanding of the organisms around us. Nipam has dedicated his career to researching life forms that have evolved uh, clever solutions and structures to survive and thrive. Some of those uh, adaptations might help us overcome problems we currently face, whether it's developing ultra-strong fi fibers, creating better adhesives, or uh, pr producing properties like color, transparency, and waterproofing. The key to unlocking these breakthroughs could be in biology. Looking uh, for inspiration in this field is, uh, has the great potential of empowering our materials uh, fabrications at the nanoscale. Today's colloquium will explore these exciting ideas that could assist our research across the laboratory. Nipam, Nipam Patel is, an, is the ideal person to help us do the, uh, uh, just that this morning. He's a leading scholar in modern evolutionary and developmental biology, focusing on the evolution of body pattern, pattern and uh, segmentation, regeneration of the germline and structural uh, coloration. His scientific expertise includes the development of novel genetic uh, model organisms for biological study, which can reveal much about human biology. He also applies advanced imaging technologies to probe the fundamental uh, uh, dynamics of living systems. Currently, he is the director of the Marine Biological Laboratory and a professor at the University of Chicago. He joined MBL in 2018 from the University of California, Berkeley, where he was a professor of molecular and cell biology and integrative biology. Previously, he was professor of organ organismal biology and autonomy at the University of Chicago, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, and a staff associate at the Carnegie Institution. He is also a longtime lecturer at MBL, uh, quite fitting uh, that he's now the director. Nipom uh, uh, received an a AB in biology from Princeton University and a PhD in biology from Stanford University. After his keynote, we'll open the floor for you to ask uh, Nipom some questions. I'm looking forward really to an engaging conversation on bioinspiration. It is a great chance for us to learn how else we can leverage our research and our, and our facilities for nanoscale discoveries. Before NEPAM speaks, I want to express my gratitude for the colloquium committee. They work hard and we really appreciate all they do. And it's now my honor to introduce um, uh, Director NEPAM Patel. So NEPAM, please. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks to, to Paul and the colloquium committee for extending this invitation and it, as Paul said it's been a very fruitful couple of days talking about ways that the MBL and Argonne might be able to collaborate in some areas of science. And so um, I'm going to talk about one of the topics near and dear to my heart which is as you'll see is understanding coloration in butterflies. 
And so that may seem a little odd to you that I am the director of the Marine Biological Laboratory and <laughs> butterflies are not a traditional marine organism. Uh, so this is a picture of the MBL. Um, we invite you all to come visit at some point. Um, we're out in Cape Cod. And in fact, our location is very much driven by the sort of biology that founded the MBL. So we live in a, we, the MBL is located in an ideal location for biodiversity. So there's warm and, war, warm and cold water currents meeting in this location. And that's why when it was founded in 1888, it was put where it was, because this is an ideal place to study biodiversity in a marine environment. But we do a lot more than that. So we definitely take advantage of the fact that we are a marine lab, but we um, study a variety of marine organisms. But in recent years, we've really been working to make them experimentally tractable so that we can do really even more sophisticated studies in them. But we also have many researchers that study ecology and climate change. Again, much of that in coastal ecosystems. We have people that are very interested in the microbiome as it relates to natural environments. And then, as Paul said, one of the things that we do is also have capabilities for some very advanced imaging in the area of light microscopy. So we sort of take all of these areas and do research in them. The other claim to fame for the MBL is the summer courses that we run. And so these are the 21 courses that we run in the summertime that are advanced training courses for graduate students and postdocs that come from all over the world. So the MBL this time of year has about 250 people in it, and in the summer we'll have 1,300 people in it. So we have this massive expansion every summer, largely because of these education programs and because of visiting scientists that come to us in the summertime. But this also helps to illustrate this wide diversity of biology that we attempt to to, to study. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is something that I've been very interested in for a while, which is understanding patterning and coloration in, in butterflies and Lepidoptera. And one thing I'll ask is that if you have questions, feel free to interrupt as I'm talking. I'm perfectly happy with that. So truth be told, part of the reason that I work on butterflies is I started collecting them when I was eight years old. And I actually have a very large collection of butterflies um, that I'm embarrassed to tell you how large. But at a certain point, I had to justify why I had this giant collection of butterflies. Um, and, and there is a lot of, of use that comes out of the butterfly collection in terms of understanding patterns of population, dynamics, and looking at you know, what's happening in climate change and things like that. But I've always been fascinated, and I think you'll all agree, that butterflies are one of these you know, macro fauna that's very appealing, right? That we're all attracted by these colors and patterns that we see on butterfly wings. And there is, in fact, increasingly a lot of knowledge about the genetics and molecular biology that underlies the patterns that you see. Much of that work was pioneered in these butterflies called heliconius butterflies that live in South America where people have done genetic crosses to map the genes responsible for the patterns that you see on the wing. But what I'd like to tackle today is a different problem, which is how you get color on the wing. And in particular, two colors, green and blue. And I'll illustrate to you that for biological systems, this actually presents an interesting challenge. Okay. So the colors and patterns that you see do have functions for the butterflies. So they aren't just for aesthetics for us. So they, you know, a lot of them are due to sexual selection, so mate selection, but they also serve protective functions. So this is just a variety of things that we know that these patterns and colors that you see on butterfly wings do. A very obvious one is camouflage. So, you know, one of my favorite examples are these dead leaf butterflies from Southeast Asia that the underside of them looks like for all the world a dead leaf to the point where they have veins that look like the leaf veins, they have mold spots, they even have clear spots that seem to be eaten through and things like that. And this is a single species, so there's also genetic variation within the species, so no two individuals look alike. So the predator can never learn a particular pattern. And they sit down on the ground with the dead leaves, and if you don't see where they sit, you have pretty much no chance of seeing where they've gone. Um, another way, of course, that they can be camouflaged is to be green, right? To sit in vegetation. So there's a little green hair streak it's sitting in the green vegetation. Again, works very well. If I hadn't seen where that butterfly landed, I just would not have been able to find it. So how do they generate these colors and patterns that you see? So the wing of butterflies are covered in structures called scales. So if you've ever 
touched a butterfly wing, which you're told not to do, and you get this dusty stuff that comes off on your fingers, it's these scales. So the scales on an adult butterfly are no longer alive. They're the dead remnant of a cell that was growing when it was a chrysalis. Okay? But it's, for a cell, it's very large. So a typical scale is about 300 microns long and about 50 microns wide. And it emerges as an outgrowth from the scale in the wing epithelia and sends out this big cellular extension. And then that cell dies when the butterfly emerges. But before it dies, it establishes an exoskeleton of chitin, the sugar polymer that the entire exoskeleton is made of. And that's a very tough material, so that survives after the cell dies. And before the cell dies, in this case, the cells have also filled up with pigment molecules. And so those are used to make colors like the browns and the yellows and the blacks. And this is just a scanning EM image on the adult scale, and you see the scale and it's held in place by a socket. And then those scales are very tough and resistant, and they last there on the surface of the butterfly. So the scales can come in a variety of shapes and colors. All right? So those colors that are what we would call from the long wavelengths of the rainbow, so colors like reds, yellows, oranges, browns, all of those are generally made by pigments. Okay? And so we understand pigments as these molecules that have particular absorption properties, and then you know, we use them to dye our clothes and things like that. And so if you think about pigments, the way they generally work is that you know, often there are these organic compounds that the ring structures will then allow them to absorb um, a, a wave, particular wavelengths of light. So in this case, this yellow highlighter has this particular compound in it, and that's good at absorbing blue light. So if you absorb blue light, and then as far as your eyes are concerned, then that's red and green light that's actually coming at you, then you perceive that as a yellow color. So that's how pigments work. And we understand in butterflies and in many systems the biosynthetic pathways that allow you to make these particular compounds that give you these pigment colors. And so animals have evolved many different pathways for, for you know, generating a number of pigment colors. But it turns out that the short parts of the rainbow, the short wavelengths, so the yellows, or sorry, the, the greens and the blues, this presents a special problem to biological systems. So to do that, they would need pigments that are very good at absorbing red and far red light. And it turns out that it's very rare for biological systems to come up with a molecule that's good at doing that. So there are particular constraints in the biochemistry and the organisms that make that actually very hard to do. There's one huge exception, of course, which is chlorophyll, which is why the world is green and why then being green is a very useful camouflage color. But it turns out that the solution instead is to use a phenomenon called structural coloration, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, that you can actually use re light refraction instead to create color. And it, this isn't, of course, limited to butterflies. So the blues and greens that you see on bird feathers are also created that way. Even the blue faces of monkeys are not from a blue pigment, but from a structural property of the skin that allows them to be blue. The iridophores of fish, and even human blue eyes. There's no blue, pig blue pigment in a human blue eye. It's actually just a phenomenon of light refraction instead that, that creates that color. So you all will be familiar with this sort of property if you look at something like a soap bubble, right? So the soap has no color, but the soap bubble has all the colors of the rainbow, okay? And the physics of that, of course, is very well understood. That when you have a material where, when you have two different materials that light is moving through, right, at that interface, where there's a change in refractive index, there's always a reflection of some of that light. And again, there's a fairly simple equation that will tell you exactly how much light is reflected at that interface. And so what the, is happening in something like a soap bubble is there's a thin layer of a material with a refractive index different than air. There is a reflection at the top surface of that material, a reflection at the bottom surface of that material, where again, the refractive index changes as the, as the wave goes out into the air. And so what, of course, can happen is that the waves can either constructively or destructively interfere depending on the particular path that they've taken. And as you all know, then, that, that for white light, which is made up of a spectrum of colors, 
that all of these colors have different wavelengths. So what that means is that when white light interacts with a thin material like this, certain wavelengths are going to undergo constructive interference and other ones are going to undergo destructive interference. And so this relatively simple equation has been known for a very long time and defines using the thickness of the material, the refractive index of the two materials, um, and, and then which wavelengths undergo maximum constructive or destructive interference. And so m here is an integer, and if you remove the one half, then you get those that undergo destructive interference, and with the one half, you get those that undergo maximum constructive interference. So what that means is if you use a system like this with just a thin layer of something of a high refractive index, you can, by tuning the thickness of that, create whatever color you would like, right? Um, and you can amplify that by repeating those layers over and over. Okay. So what I'm going to show you in the next picture is a moth. And in that moth, the only pigment color in the moth is black. Okay. But the moth can create all the colors of the rainbow. Okay. And it does that because all of the individual scales are multi-layers of chitin air. And the individual scales that are different colors have different thicknesses of chitin layers. So the butterfly, as the scales have developed, has tuned those thicknesses in order to create all of these different colors. Okay? So you can, in fact, create all the colors of the rainbow, and butterflies and moths do do this using structural coloration. Another great example are the blue morpho butterflies. Have you ever seen these steel blue butterflies that fly in Central and South America? They're quite spectacular looking, this brilliant, bright, bright, metallic blue color. One way we can show that this is a structural color is we can play a little bit of game with the refractive index. So what you're about to see in this movie is a drop of acetone hit the wing. So acetone has a refractive index of 1.3, it displaces the air, so now instead of being blue, it's an iridescent green color because we've changed the math of what's going on here. So what do the nanostructures look like that create this? So in the case of the morpho, this is one of their scales in a scanning EM. They have ridges on them that run the length of the scale, but all scales have that as part of their structural component. But if we take a cross-section across these ridges, so across here, what you see is this incredible sort of Christmas tree shape. And here's your one micron or scale bar, so you can see how that these are very, very small structures. And they have to be, so the idea is that they're below a half, length, half wavelength of light in order to create this phenomenon. So it turns out that the thickness of those branches on the trees and the spacing between the trees is just right to get massive constructive interference of blue light. And so, and destructive interference of other wavelengths, and then there's black pigment down here to prevo pre prevent backscattering of light. And so you get this beautiful blue color. And again, if we now just let the acetone evaporate off the wing, the air will go back into the space. It'll go right back to that blue color. All right? So that's an example of how they do it. As I mentioned, green is a very useful color for camouflage. It turns out that only one genera of butterflies ever invented a green pigment. And every other solution is a structural solution to the problem instead. So these little green butterflies will be abundant here in the early spring, and you'll see them in the, in the grasses. And so if you look at one of their scales, so this is white light reflected off of one of their scales, but what you see is this green color, and you see facets of green, what look like facets inside the scale. If we break open one of these scales, so these are the ridges, but that's not the source of the light refraction. It's actually this honeycomb structure that's down inside the scale. But this honeycomb structure has a very particular shape to it. So it's a gyroid. And so I always find this a fascinating story that in 1970, it was a mathematical equation defining a triply periodic minimal surface. And, it, and if you go through the space of this structure and fill it, 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 it actually then generates two non-overlapping areas of space. So it was an equation that defines this shape, and then people discovered that this actually exists inside the scales of butterflies. And so when it's at just the right dimensional size, it actually gives you constructive interference of green light. And that's how those butterflies happen to be green. And in fact, butterflies have, invented, have evolved this structure three times independently. So even though it looks like a crazy complicated way to solve the problem, that's how they've actually done it multiple occasions. Um, other examples, so like these bird wing butterflies with a nice green color on them, they use a morpho-like solution. So they have both blue and green scales, and they can actually change the geometry of those nanostructures on those scales in order to create 
different colors like that. I should also point out that the black is also due to a nanostructure. So you can make simple black by having melanin pigment, but in fact, you, you probably, again, are all familiar with this idea of super black, that you can have scales that really are incredibly good at absorbing every photon that hits them. And so, in fact, these black scales have these, actually, their own structures that allow, no, that prevent most of the photons from ever escaping. So you actually get this sort of super black, velvety black color. So butterflies make extensive use of this kind of phenomenon. One more example I'll show you is this butterfly here called the emerald green swallowtail. So it does sit like this, so it sits with its wings open in the rainforest, and that green and black color helps it to blend into the shadows and the vegetation. So that actually works quite well. If you look at one of their scales, so this is a view shining white light, and what you see is that it's a combination of yellow plus blue. So the way this works is that those dimples, those indentations, which are about five microns across, they're a multi-layer of chitinine air. So this is a cross section through one of those dimples. So what happens is when white light hits the bottom of the dimple, you have constructive interference of yellow light. But when it hits the side of the dimple, because then the spacing is different, you get a retroreflection of blue light. So it's that yellow plus blue, but of course you perceive that as a green color. But one of the fascinating things about this is that because the blue retroreflects, it becomes polarized, and they see polarized light. So to them, they are not the color of the vegetation. So they can see each other just fine. So they're not camouflaged for themselves, but they are camouflaged to any vertebrate predator, which perceives them instead as green. Okay, so I've given you examples then of some of these nanostructures. And in fact, you can pick up literally more than 100 papers by optical physicists who all do the same thing. They have a, you know, a dead butterfly that they're interested in. Well, how does this color exist? They go ahead and do SEM and TEM. They work out the thicknesses and the geometries. They do the math, and then they say, this is how it is this color, right? Yes? Uh, you mentioned um, that butterflies see polar the polarized light. Um, I understand birds see in ultraviolet and, and so yep. do butterflies. Have you looked at, at the uh, ultraviolet? Or Yes, and, and definitely butterflies, some butterflies will create UV patterns using structural coloration. So, yeah, that's important because we often just think about what we see, but of course, you know, many organisms see a much wider gamut of colors than we do, and that, that is important. So the polarization is one example, and yes, seeing out in the UV is another one. And they do do structural color for UV, and they actually have pigments that are that actually then give them UV dark spots too, so they can do both of those things. Right. So, so again, the idea is that people have studied this, you know, who are people who are able to understand the optical phenomena and the physics, and they will look at all of these structures that butterflies make. And then, of course, there's a great interest then in biomimicry. Can you then, using you know, human material, engineering materials and principles, actually make the same sorts of things? So in the case of that dimple structure, uh, a number of years ago, a number of years ago, a couple labs actually all did the same sort of experiment and to see if they could replicate that dimple structure coloration. So in this case, I think these were these were polystyrene styrene beads put onto a colloidal gold surface on a silicon wafer to create the dimples, and then these are alternating layers of titanium dioxide and aluminum. And so that creates the right kind of refractive index, and you can show that you can manufacture something that has the exact same properties as that butterfly dimple. Okay, but the problem comes in is that it actually becomes not that easy to make these structures using those engineering principles. It becomes relatively expensive, and people start to use fairly, you know, a lot of compounds which will work fine but are not very biocompatible. And there's a lot of interest, though, in this sort of biomimicry because, as, as I don't need to tell you know, this audience, there's a lot of applications to nanoparticles. And many of the structures that you see in butterflies have been suggested as being very useful, having very useful properties for not just color, but other um, useful um, properties as well. So, for example, those morpho butterfly wings with those nanostructures, those actually also cause the wing to be extremely hydrophobic. And so water comes right off, and it's very hard for um, dirt to get on there or anything. They, they wash right off. They're also often antimicrobial as well. Microbes find them incompatible 
Um, there are people who've used these to then do um, optical detection of vapor in air, and then there's ideas about using them in order to improve the efficiency of solar cells. So those are just some of the examples outside of the color to the that provide some um, desire to actually be able to use these nanostructures for other purposes. But as I said, the problem is, is that you know, they can be difficult to manufacture. So what's driven me is really the, quite, is, is the idea that, well, maybe if we understood how the butterfly made this, that would actually be useful, right? So if we understood how biological systems are able to generate these kinds of nanostructures. And we essentially have almost no idea right now how a butterfly is able to generate these fantastic structures. And remember, they have to be very accurately patterned. So if that structure is 10 nanometers off in its thickness, it's the wrong color. It's of no use to the butterfly. So how do these, and, and these are individual cells that are able to create these nanostructures. So how do they go about that? So that's the, the challenge that we've, we've put to ourselves is as developmental biologists, can we understand how butterflies, how living cells actually create these nanostructures? So right away, there are some challenges. So one of them is, is that if you've ever looked at a butterfly chrysalis, you can't see into it. So how do we actually see when the butterfly is making these structures? So, and again, all of this occurs during this pupil stage when it's in a chrysalis. So the, the cells actually pattern, set out, and the scale grows all during that period. So the first thing we did was just to characterize some of the basic properties of how the scales grow. So this is an emerging scale on the epithelia, and what you're seeing in yellow is the filamentous F-actin inside of the cell. So this is the internal cytoskeleton that it's going to use to grow. So the scales grow relatively rapidly. Here's just the membrane of the scales as they grow out over the wing. Um, and you can see they sort of grow out like tiles across the surface. And again, now they have this very organized cytoskeleton inside of them, a filamentous actin, which is what they're using as their internal <coughs> skeleton. And this is an optical cross-section through one of, a couple of these scales. And so again, the pink is the membrane of the scale, so you can see that. And then you can see that this actin, these polymerized actin rods are growing or forming just underneath that membrane. And they form these very extremely regular structures on the surface of the scale that's allowing it to grow out. So then the next thing that happens is the scale now begins to secrete chitin, so that polymer. And so now the pink is that chitin secretion. And what you can see is they're secreting the chitin between those rods of actin. So they're, that's how they're creating the spacing of the ridges. And that may be a relatively passive thing, that where the actin is polymerized underneath the membrane, there's no way to secrete in that space. So you're forced to template outside of that. So the next thing that the scale will do is now disassemble those actin rods. Okay, because now it has an ex external skeleton on the outside now from that chitin. And then it can finish secreting chitin across that entire surface. We can show that the F-actin is really necessary. We can use chemicals that depolymerize the F-actin. And if we do that while the scales are growing, they just collapse into a mess. So they really need that F-actin to, to template this entire process. So, but I'll bring this back to the question of how you use that to help you think about how structural color is created. So remember in these butterflies, not only are there the ridges, but there are these dimple shapes. So you don't just have ridges on here, but you actually also deform the membrane into these dimples and then put chitin onto that in a multi-layer of chitin. So if you look at these particular green scales while they're growing in this butterfly, so initially they have rods of actin just like every other scale does. But they do something quite remarkable. When, they, when other scales would break down the actin, they instead reorganize it. So this is one of these scales now. And you're seeing um, the membrane again in pink here. And so you see the ridges here, and you'll see just the beginning of the dimples. But what you see is the actin reorganizes into hexagons. And it only reorganizes on the top surface. The bottom surface of the scale still stays rods. So we have no idea how the cell can do this, right? So it's taking straight rods of actin and suddenly turning them into hexagons of actin. So of course what we thought is that well, what we want to do is just you know, look at enough of these pupae, and this is again all dead material, fixed material, because of the way we're having to do the experiments, and just find intermediates and ask, well, how does it do this? And basically we can't. So it seems to just go immediately from these rods into hexagons very, very rapidly, okay? 
So we have some ideas about how you might do it, but we really need to be able to observe this live in order to understand how it's actually managing this. So of course now we have a challenge because we're asking to visualize these living cells inside of the butterfly chrysalis. So what we've done, initially we tried to develop ways to grow the wings outside of the butterfly. So these are isolated wings of a morpho and a buckeye butterfly growing in culture. And so they're growing for a couple days and you can see as they progress all those pigment patterns come in. So we can replicate that that phenomena or the, those phases in a, in a petri dish. But you might have noticed that this structural blue was already there when we started the culture. So it wasn't very intense because the black pigment hadn't come in yet. And it turns out that if we try to remove the wings at very, very early stages before they've built the nanostructures, we can't get them to grow. So we can't do them in a dish. So what we've done instead is develop ways to be able to image into the pupae instead. So basically to be able to create windows in the pupae without harming the wing. And so what you're seeing here is eight days of pupil development of this buckeye butterfly. And you see the wing is developed here, and you can see the wing veins, and then you'll see this sort of silvery color as the scales initially start to grow. And then at the end of the movie, you'll see all the pigment patterns appear in this wing. So the wing forms and develops completely normally. Okay, but we can see it in the entire time. So now we can observe what we want in the living scales. So then we've also engineered ways to be able to see the filamentous acting in the live scale. So it was a very early movie, and you can see the scales growing over the course of a couple days. There's a slightly better movie. The colors are just depth coding to help you see um, a little bit better. And so you're seeing the scales grow, you're seeing the actin get organized, and so on. So now we can begin to investigate at a much better level what's going on in the living system. Obviously, we have a long ways to go for being able to visualize the nanostructures themselves, because then we need to be beyond the resolution of light. But as you may know, there's a lot of tricks now to be able to do that with living systems. So that's what we're attempting to continue to develop for this. The, this particular group of butterflies is also really um, an interesting one to look at because they can actually make a whole variety of colors. So I've shown you this papilia with the green colors, but these butterflies can actually, in this, in this small group, can actually make everything from sort of a purplish blue color to a yellow color. But they do it all with these dimples, but what they can do is either tune the thickness of the chitin layers or they can change the geometry of those dimples to create different colors. So for example, this butterfly here, um, Papilio ulysses, is blue, but you'll see that it doesn't have those same dimples. It has straight, steep walls, so it has no retroreflection going on. We can do things like actually create reconstructions of the surface of the scale using um, some imaging tools, and then we can put back onto it the colors that are actually coming off of the scale. So we can understand how the geometry affects the color. So here's another butterfly that is a, a, a more lemony green color. And you can see that there's no blue retroreflection in this system. And the shape of those dimples is really quite different. So we're interested in looking not only at the, at the one swallowtail that has the green color, but the other closely related species to see how they've modified that to create the different colors. You also have variation within populations. So this is a, a butterfly that lives on different islands in Indonesia, but on some islands this area of the wing is blue and, and in others this area of the wing is green. So you can have that variation within the population. You can even have a, a phenomenon known as polyphenism. So this is a butterfly, Papilio mackie from Japan, and the summer generation is blue and the spring generation is green. So the butterfly can't change color. So the scales aren't alive, they can't change color. But what happens is they perceive the day-night length when they're larvae. And then based on whether they're going into spring or summer, they actually make different colored adults. So they are able to then have that environmental signal and then use that as a cue to tune the way that they shape the scales and the, and the nanostructures to create different colors. Finally, we can, um, there's some, some ability to do some genetics. So this is Papilio pneumogeni and Pericles. And again, they look really different from one another and have very different colors. But it turns out that they're actually very closely related. They normally never see each other because on they're on, on islands about 1,000 miles apart. 
but you can actually take them in the lab and you can make them together and you can make hybrids and you can see that the hybrids have a color in between the two. So again, it gives you an added layer of sort of experimental tractability to asking how they create some of these. I mean, and some of you might be interested to see that you can in fact combine pigment and structural color as well. So this is a butterfly um, in the genus Propona. It has these nice blue iridescent bands created by a structural component. And this is another butterfly of a different genera called Agrius that has red. Strangely enough, you can actually cross these butterflies to each other and get hybrids. And you can see the hybrid can combine the blue and the red. And in fact, what happens is it has now scales with red pigment, but the nanostructures to create blue. So butterflies can also do that matching of pigment to nanostructure to create other colors as well. So the, what I'll, I'll switch to here real quick now is telling you about the other approach that we're taking to, to looking at this. And that's a genetic approach. So the, the approach with the, the swallowtail butterflies with the green is one where we're sort of using the cell biology to ask, well, how does it shape these um, dimples and how does it create the nanostructures? But another approach is a genetic approach to actually ask, well, what are the genes responsible for creating the nanostructures? What are the pathways, the genetic pathways? So for that, we use this butterfly called the buckeye, which is extremely common throughout the entire United States. And you might say this is a terrible choice because it's all the colors I told you were pigment colors, brown and yellow and orange and everything. But it turns out it has close relatives that live in other parts of the world that have beautiful iridescent blue and green on their wings. So the buckeye that we normally see in, in the United States doesn't have much structural color. But it has a little bit. And the other important point is that the American buckeye, that species right there, is embedded in this clade of butterflies that has plenty of structural color. So as I mentioned, they don't have much, but in fact, if you collect butterflies, this butterfly in the Midwest, you will see occasionally some iridescent blue on the wing. Okay? So there's a woman named Edith Smith in Florida who is raising these butterflies. So she's raising them commercially. So if you've ever been to like butterfly houses where you can walk through and see tropical butterflies flying around, there are normally these places that raise butterflies in the Philippines and Costa Rica and Africa, and they ship them to the United States. And then there's also a few people in the US that raise them. So she's raising them for that, and also I get apparently for wedding releases, because I guess that's a thing to do that. <laughs> and she noticed that you know, in the population she was raising in Florida that she had a little bit of blue. So she thought, well, what happens if I take the bluest ones and let them mate together? So she did that for a year, which is about 12 generations. And she managed to make them incredibly blue. So she turned them into this. And the way we ended up with these is that we order butterflies from her for our own experiments. And one time we got a shipment, and they came out this color. And we were like, what are these things? <laughs> and so we asked her, what, did you, what, what is this? And she said, oh, do you like them? I made them. And so, so but she had done a, a, a classic selection experiment. So she had a phenotype. She selected for that phenotype and was able to then Basically what she's doing is a genetic selection experiment. She is then selecting for those alleles in the population that allow this structural color to be abundant on the, on the wing. So Rachel Thayer, a graduate student in the lab, undertook the um, project of asking, well, what happened? How did they end up with this blue color? So Rachel looked and she discovered that in fact it's not the top surface of the scale that's doing this, it's the bottom or the lamina, the bottom chitin layer. So if you flip the scale over, you see it really well. And this is the top view, but you scrape off the ridges and you see, again, the structural blue extremely well. So what happens here is that this is an example of a very simple system to create structural color. It's just this lamina layer has reached just exactly the right thickness to be this constructive interference of blue. So it's basically one half the wavelength of blue light in order to do this. So, but where did it come from? So, in fact, there had been modeling to show that if you just adjust the thickness of the lamina, you can make all sorts of colors. So these are the different thicknesses of the lamina, the spectra that you get, and the perceived color that you're going to get with that thickness. So what Rachel found is that, in fact, what the starting butterfly that looks brown is actually gold. So the lamina is very thin, and it gives this reflection of sort of yellowish-red light, this constructive interference of yellow-red light. And so what happened in those selection experiments is that we went from a lamina that was about 100 nanometers thick to something that was closer to 200 nanometers thick. 
And that's what the selection had done, right? So now we can ask, well, how do you do that, okay? But we can also ask, is, is what happened here in the selection experiment the same thing that evolution has done um, in the generation of variation within different species? So if we look at these butterflies that naturally have this iridescent blue and green that are related, they in fact do exactly that. It's the lamina of the scale that's been tuned to the right thickness to give this structural color, okay? So, and again, then the idea is that you can tune the lamina to do that. So how, what happens when the scales are growing? Can we see this lamina being laid down? So again, we're asking to see something that's below half a wavelength of light, so we can't, with light itself, see it. But there is another way we can observe the phenomena. So this is the, that same movie that I showed you before of a wing developing in a pupae. But now I'm focused on just a particular part of the wing, and you may have noticed there was a little bit of iridescent color. So this is an area of the wing that's going to be a greenish blue color. And if we watch the movie, you see it go through that yellow to purple to blue and into a bluish green. So in fact, what it's doing is it's going through this series. So we can tell you how thick that lamina is by the wavelengths coming off of it. So in fact, one of the things we're doing is building a hyperspectral microscope to be able to look at the spectrum off of these nanostructures and use that as a way to indirectly tell you what's happening to the nanostructures that's being built. So that's one way to do it. But the other way we can now ask how these butterflies do this is to take advantage of genetics and genomics. So what we can do is we can now mate, or we have mated, the brown butterfly to the blue butterfly. Remember, they're only separated by 12 generations, so they'll still freely interbreed just fine. So in the F1 generation, the offspring of this, they have equal chromosome components from the, the brown parent and the blue parent. And these F1s mostly look brown, but they have a significant amount of blue on them, and they look very uniform. But then in the next generation, you make brothers and sisters together, you get this F2 generation. So because of recombination of the chromosomes, these butterflies, first of all, have spectacular phenotypic variation in the colors and the amount of iridescence that they have. But of course they also have different amounts of chromosomes that have been inherited from either the brown grandparent or the blue grandparent. So what we do is we sequence these butterflies so we can say which part of their genome came from the brown grandparent or the blue grandparent and we phenotype the wing and then we can map where the genes are that control the color. Or, or quantitatively control a variation. So those F2 butterflies, here's just an example of these four wings. So you can see lots of variation in the amount of the wing that has the blue color and in the hue of the color. So if we only take those wings that just vary in the percent of the wing that has iridescence, so as opposed to what the hue actually is, and we use that as our phenotype, and then we use that to map the genes there are three genes of major effect that we've, we've actually added a lot more. I should mention that the size of these F2 families is really large. So Rachel was able to raise one family that was 501 individuals and another was 273. And I didn't actually even know that a female butterfly lays that many eggs, much less that someone could raise them all to adulthood. But that gives us, gives us a lot of power for being able to map the low side. So this is only from a fraction of the data, but when we put in all the data, there are three very significant effects, so one, two, and then this one actually rises well above the significance line with more data. So there are three loci in the genome that control the percent of the wing that has this iridescence. And we actually already know what one of these genes is, this particular one here. It's a gene called optics, which is a transcription factor which was first studied because it controls red coloration in neoconius. But we can do CRISPR knockout experiments in these buckeye butterflies. And in fact, if we take the brown buckeye and we knock out the optics gene, suddenly it becomes iridescent blue. So it makes sense that that is one of the genes that controls this iridescence. Okay. We don't know, for example, what this locus is, which has an even bigger effect on the genetic variation. But I think more exciting is to, is to look at the wings that actually have the same percent coverage but differ in hue. So they go from purple through blue to turquoise to green. So this is a variation in thickness of the lamina from about 140 nanometers to about 240 nanometers. So now we can ask what genes can precisely control the thickness down to you know, plus or minus 10 nanometers or so. And so when we do that, there are four loci that seem to come up to being significant effect on the hue of the, of the wing. So these are 
genes that somehow could control precisely the thickness of that nanostructure. We don't know what any of these genes are yet, but we're working on that to look in those intervals and then identify the individual genes to ask how does the system work. And then again, we can use um, genome editing to actually ask if those candidate genes are the right thing. So I hope from this that you can see that our mapping data suggests that there are three major effect loci that have a big switch from a thin lamina to a thick lamina, so getting you this iridescence. And then there seem to be about four genes that control the very precise thickness of that. So this gives us inroads into understanding biologically how these systems are able to generate these nanostructures. I mean, we're a long ways from telling you how it's done, but this is the approach to finding it. Okay. And I'll end, and I'm probably running out of time, so I'll be quick here. So I'll end by just telling you that the other thing that we're studying is transparency in butterflies. So this is something else that they're able to do is a camouflage mechanism is to be incredibly transparent. And they, again, have evolved this over and over again, is this level of transparency. And so if you just look at what the wings have done in different transparent species, basically what you find is everything you can imagine to do to be transparent, some butterfly or moth has figured out how to do. So the simplest, um, well, the most common solution, sorry, is to turn the scales back into bristles. So they become very thin, like looking like little hairs, and then light can go through the wing membrane instead. There's some moths that have figured out how to actually make transparent scales. You get strange solutions like this one where they just turn the scales vertically instead so that you can see through them, okay? So there's a couple of approaches that we're taking to study that. But I'll just end by telling you one thing that you may notice that you know, some of these butterflies actually, they're not that transparent, they glare, right? So one of the problems is if you just get the, the scales out of the way, you know, it only works so well as being transparent because there's still a refractive index change and so you get some glare. So it's like having a piece of glass, okay, it looks transparent in the shadow, but you put it in the sunlight and you can see where the glass is because it's reflecting sunlight. So they've actually evolved um, anti-reflective coatings on their wings, which are, again, nanostructures that sit between these, these bristles. And so that's something else that we're actively investigating is also transparency. So I'll go ahead and end there and take any questions that you might have. So thanks. Thank you very much, uh, how wonderful, huh? really fascinating, just incredible. Uh, who knew? It's kind of my other reaction here, really fantastic. Okay, he's got a question. How did you do the in-situ work where you were watching the wings grow? Yeah, so um, it's a great example. So as I mentioned, one of the things we do is we have these advanced training courses, right? And so I often sort of cheat and I, as when the students are all there, I give them interesting problems to try to solve including ones that we think are generally unsolvable, right, and just let them have a go at it. But this was in a case of a failed experiment leading to a great result. So one of the other people teaching in the course was, was um, he, he talked about how in Drosophila, when it develops, if you kill part of the wing while it's in the pupae, it can regenerate and have a normal wing. So one of the students, um, we were, had butterflies for other reasons in the course. And so he was determined that he would try this experiment in butterflies. And we had a technique where you can cut at the base of the leg of the caterpillar and the imaginal disc for the wing will come out and then you can cut it off. So he was, and then we usually cut it off and do our experiments with it. But he cut it off and he said, I wanna, I wanna see if it regenerates. And we're like, it's not gonna regenerate because there's nothing left to regenerate it from. But he was determined to just take a whole bunch of caterpillars and do this. So of course it didn't regenerate, but if you cut off the four-wing disc, what happens is it also makes the covering on the pupae on that side. So then the pupa forms with no four-wing but with a clear membrane. And so all you have to do is then just put a piece of saran wrap so it doesn't die of dehydration through that opening and you can watch the hind wing completely normally. So, and then we've developed other tricks to be able to, even in the pupae, flip the wing open so that we can keep it flat and to image it. And then the way that we can see what's going on is we inject in the case of actin, we inject suract, which is a, it's a derivative of a toxin that normally depolymerizes actin, but it's been modified so it's fluorescent, and we can watch the live actin without disturbing it. So those, those are examples of like, you know, when you work on the biological systems, solving all those little problems that you're gonna have for imaging and keeping them alive. <laughs>
with those images, are you able to extract kinetics and look at the rates of growth to see if there's any distinction between uh, different different uh, colors? Yeah, and that's a great thing and uh, that we can do. We haven't done it yet. But there are some obvious ones that you can see. Like, you know, uh, uh, butterflies actually have some scales that look way more like hairs, right? So they're really long and elongated. And so there's a simple thing there where we can ask, well, so what do you do differently to get two different morphologies as well? So do you grow faster? Do you grow longer? Do you, you know? And so those are things now that we can live image. We can ask all those sorts of questions. But that's where, you know, so that we've been talking with collaboratively about the the actual quantitative analysis, something that you know you all are much better at doing. I mean, we do do some, and you know our imaging scientists are very good at it. But that's something where we can think of a whole bunch of different ways to now analyze. Because as you as you are going to imagine, right now when we take these images, we're suddenly flooded with data that we need to analyze. And then one follow up is: uh, Do you ever look at the ordering of the kite? Is it crystalline? And that's another thing that you know we haven't looked at. There's there's many. So it turns out that the genome is full of genes that are involved in not just chitin synthesis but modifying the chitin as well. So, but those modifications don't change the refractive index, but they change the the um, you know how stiff it is and things like that. So obviously we are very curious as to how you use that to shape it, and we have very little knowledge of how the butterfly is really secreting any of this structure. So the, the gyroids, for example, the model is, is that's in the endoplasmic reticulum instead. But there are, there are a couple different models of how it, whether it folds the ER first or not in order to generate those. And then like with the morphos, we don't know, does it make that chitin structure inside the cell and then push it out, or does it actually synthesize it from the top down on the outside? Nobody actually knows the answer to any of those questions right now. But those would be things where understanding the, the polymer properties of the chitin would also be really useful because a lot of people think that a lot of it is self-assembly. Right. Right? And that's important for manufacturing. Yeah. 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 Um, do you know if anybody's looking at using these transparent membranes as a replacement for plastic? Yeah, that's a, a great idea. I mean, so they're, again, chitin-based. Right, membranes, and the way that they become really anti-reflective um, is that they actually, let's see, I think I have a picture to show you. Yeah, so, right, so the idea is that, as you know, you pay more, like, to have your glasses be anti-reflective, right? And so, you know, we think, of course, that's great, that's a great human invention, but butterflies figured that out a long time ago. So between those bristles, these are the nanostructures that they build. And there's a debate as to exactly how that nanostructure works, whether it causes a slow change in refractive index as the light goes through, or whether it basically just diffuses the light so that there's no strict glare. It seems that they do both. And these are actually made by a combination of chitin and wax to create this code. But again, they've evolved it many times over and over again. And you actually see lots of different solutions to the exact same problem. So again, that's an example where there could be some really good applications to it if we understood what the butterfly was doing. Yeah, and you mentioned that they're, that they're dirt resistant and hydrophobic, so maybe it could you know, be used where we use plastics for like water bottles yeah. and stuff. I wonder if that could be... And the question is, you know, then do we understand enough to make it economical to manufacture it? Help, help, uh, yeah. So you mentioned that the day-night cycle led to structural changes in that one species of butterfly. You identified any other epigenetic factors such as temperature change, chemical contamination, radiation yeah. that would affect development in the subsequent structure? Right. So, so it turns out that there's a number of ways that that can happen in, in butterflies. So there's, uh, for example, there's caterpillars that um, can either be brown or green. And it depends on the time of year, whether the vegetation they're eating is brown or green. So if they start off as little caterpillars and it's the dry season and they start to eat it, then they end up brown caterpillars. And if it's the wet season and the vegetation is green. And so it's known that that's because they sense the chemistry of the plant that they're eating. And then they match their color to that plant. So that's an example where the chemi 
the chemistry of their food is affecting the, in that case, the pigments that they synthesize. But the, the colors, the structural color, the butterfly can actually either use day, night, or temperature as the cue for knowing which direction it's going into the season. And both of those will work as cues for that butterfly. Um, but it's through a hormone, so that's, it senses it as a juvenile, it changes hormone production, and then influences the imaginal disc when it's developing to make the nanostructures different for different colors. Thank you. A couple of questions for me. Uh, how about, do you have a favorite butterfly? Quite a collection. So it's a bad question to ask uh, someone who's really enthusiastic about butterflies. <laughs> yeah. So uh, people ask that, it's very difficult. But I often pull out like a drawer of like little blue butterflies. And then people are like, well, they're not all that spectacular. And it's not that they're spectacular, they have an incredible life history. So that's uh, these little lysinid butterflies, which you will get in the grass around here. They're completely dependent on ants to survive. So the females lay their eggs next to the ant nest, and then the ants carry the egg into the nest, and they take care of the larvae because the larvae makes a drug that the ants are addicted to. And then the ants protect the larvae and take care of it. And the larvae has no chance of survival if the ants don't take care of it. So that's like one of my favorite butterflies, even though to look at it, it doesn't look very complicated. And how about a little bit uh, in terms of your collection? And I know uh, you mentioned that uh, you don't really go out in the field anymore. Yeah. To collect it. Yeah, so I buy up old collections and, and things like that now in order to do it. And I, but, you know, I think the advantage to, I mean, it's an example where the, for us one of the things is, is that anytime we have an interesting question that we're looking for, like, well, let's, you know, analyze all the butterflies that have this particular structure in them. Because it's my own collection, I can choose to destroy the specimens if I need to for experiments, so. Well, really fascinating. Uh, I'm going to ask you as well to introduce the team that's here from MBL, if you don't mind, uh, I think that would be a very okay. appropriate. Now, thing to do now well. I'm on the spot to find them all. Okay, so <laughs> why don't we start um, with Anne Sylvester, who's the director of research at the MBL, and then Linda Hyman, who's the director of education, um, and then Allison, who's my chief of staff, and then we have our imaging scientist Abhishek Kumar, he's here, and then a postdoc in his lab. Um, and uh, then also Maureen Conti, where's Maureen, who's an MBL fellow. Uh, and sorry, the postdoc is not just postdoc, it's Matthew, sorry, I apologize. <laughs> uh, did I, sorry, did I? John. John, oh yeah. And John uh, Henry, who, um, as Paul has commented, has the outstanding title Senior Aquarist. Um, and so John builds automated systems to help us raise animals, so. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. We've had a very rich conversation. It continues a bit yet today, and uh, we're looking forward to really strengthening our collaboration with MBL. And, uh, I think we've got, uh, as you can see, some great science. We've done many things to learn. Really, uh, fantastic opportunities to think about how we can use these ideas in our research activities as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.